A quick thank you to the T5 peeps, Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Dark Machine, Estrella the Dreamer, Mesic, Pudic Yol, Casper Arnholtz, and Chaos to Mist. Thank you very much. Story number one. Why do you do this? Written by Xvila. Only a few more meters, Clark thought to himself. He was following his human guide who had asked him to join on, on this expedition. Why did I agree to this? He had agreed because it was his job. He was here to learn about these humans, and this seemed like a tremendous opportunity to do so. They were the latest species to join the galactic community, and they were quite baffling to everyone. Complete outliers in every major sociological model in the galaxy. Any information on them would be extremely valuable. But that didn't make him regret this any less. The thin air around him might be frigid, while below freezing point of water, the wind howled and he was extremely glad of his pressurized environmental suit. He tried not to look at the display which showed the alarming rate at which using power to keep him alive. Outside the suit, he was wearing a powered mobility exoskeleton that boosted his strength ten times. But still, every muscle in his body ached, even the ones he didn't know he had. His guide was wearing clothing, just clothing. Bright one-piece overalls with a thick padded insulation, waterproof boots, helmet, goggles, and neck gaiter. All made from nothing more than synthetic and natural fibers. But his back, he had a large framework backpack that looked heavy enough to cry that he thought he would topple just standing in the grueling 10 meters per second surface gravity of this world had. Yet, he moved without any sort of mechanical assist. There were three other humans in his team. They were following behind Cly, all similarly equipped, but the different colors for easy identification. Two of them, however, had conceded to some assistance. Each was wearing a face mask connected to an oxygen bottle. The rock face gave way to a windswept ice and snow. Cly could now see the summit a little further ahead on the top of the final upward sloping ledge of ice. Final push. Few more steps. Finally, his guide stopped. They were there. The humans in the team all raised their arms above their heads and started making noises that each translator could not translate. Two of them hugged each other. Cly observed the humans. Then he looked at the ground. The snow was hard packed, just like it had been on the way here. He looked outward from the peak. The Himalayas extended into the horizon underneath him in all directions. The view did not look substantially different from what he had seen lower as they had ascended, or from the one he had seen from the window of the transport aircraft that had brought them here. He closed his eyes and concentrated. He tried to feel an epiphany, a revelation, a religious experience, something, anything. He felt no different than before. He was merely glad that the worst was over. One of the humans had dug out a bottle of champagne from her backpack and was handing out cups to everyone. Cly took one out of courtesy, but he would not be able to join in on the drink because of his environmental suit. Not that drinking diluted organic solvent would be a good idea for him in the first place. With everyone provided, she led them to a toast, another peculiar human custom. With her cup raised up, she called with an out-of-breath voice, To us, conquerors of Mount Everest! Mount Everest came the response that everybody chugged their drink, till I merely mimicked the motions. After a while, the human settled down, till I walked over to his guide, the large man was breathing rapidly, as if he was running out of breath. Icicles had formed around the hood of his overalls, and on the cloth he breathed through. Cly knew that if they stayed here for more than a few hours, his guide would die simply from the thinness of the air. That made this seem all the more crazy to him. Matthew, I'm struggling to understand this. I was hoping that experiencing this with you would let me see, but I'm still puzzled. Why do you do this? Matthew pulled his gator down from his mouth. You know, George Mallory, the first man who attempted to climb this mountain, was asked the same question. Cly cocked his head. What did he answer? Matthew smiled. Because it's there. Cly pondered that for a moment. What happened to him? He died trying. 
Cry was silent. He threw away his life. And for what? A mountain, just because it was there. Did nobody learn from his folly? It didn't stop you. Oh, no, Matthew grinned. For the next thirty years, people tried harder than ever. Until finally, in the mid-twentieth century, Sir Edmund Hillary made it to the top. How was that, then? Cry thought to himself. It was done as crazy as it was, and people could go back to their lives. But that didn't explain why they were here. Now. So, um, why did you climb up here, then? It's still here, isn't it? End of story. Story number two. Post-incident inspection, freighter, written by Glitch Key. You're on your probationary period as an inspector, right? To Coden, glanced at his companion as they made their way down to the dock. Yeah, almost not, though. Then I can actually do something with this trading. To Colin chuckled as he rounded the corner. Chances are you haven't seen one of these yet. Come along, Glempat. This has got to be interesting. Glempat rounded the corner and it came into view. He almost tripped over his own feet out of the distraction. What the hell is that? To Colin's chest rumbled a bit. <laughs> that was a freighter. Glempat moved closer, his eyes scanning the ship repeatedly. You've got to be playing some kind of joke. Why are we here? Half the hell is gone. Just condemn it and move on. <laughs> no can do. To Colin pulled out his data pad, hit a button, and Clempat's pad chimed to mock receiving a synchronized form. This freighter came in like this. Full crew. Humans. Humans. Clempat shook his head, then scanned the hull again. Looks like it, um, what even happened? Report says it's a mistimed jump left them lodged in an asteroid. No casualties, and there were only a few humans on board to start. Pretty standard menagerie crew for a long-haul freighter, really. Uh-huh. Human family group? Take a look at the form. It has a crew manifest. Standard procedure for these incidents. Putting out his data pad, Klempa scanned quickly through it until he found the obviously human names... Family groups normally have shared names, right? Oh, yep. Sigh, he stepped towards the ship. May as well show me what happens with these. Don't step on board. Not yet. Gotta start from the outside with the hull breach. You've got to be kidding me. Kempa gestured towards the gaping hole along the side of the ship. There's nothing to see. Dakota pulled out a handheld scanner and pointed it at the ship as he slowly walked a semicircle around it. That's kind of the reason that we're here. New rules. We log everything. Call in a large jump freighter. Send the reports and the ships back to processing facility. The Federation wants to know why this happens. You've, um... Clempat sighed, pulling out his own scanner and began scanning the hull. We're gonna be here all day, huh? Oh, uh, yep. As they stepped through the bulkhead, the entire ship shifted to the side and the bone-tingling wail of the tearing metal could be heard. You gotta be kidding me. Nobody could survive this. Everyone on board survived it. How? Tukodan shook his head and stared towards the bridge. That's what we're supposed to figure out. Mind the holes. Um, actually, speaking of, um, look at them. Ha! Huh. You caught on fast. Tukodan glanced back at the gap that he had just hopped. Yeah, it's in the report. One of the humans said something about, and I quote, hot-wiring the damn ground field to make a bubble and keep the ship's insides inside. And that just happens to make a perfect ring-shaped warp to every metal edge within a quarter meter of the outside. I doubt this rusty old tub had a grav generator accurate enough to even be completely monodirectional in normal operations. No bet. You're right on that. That is impossible. Dakotan just kept walking towards the bridge. Get used to it. These uh, incidents are becoming more common by the day as humans show up on more crew rosters. Fewer lost ships, more impossible survival stories. There any point in continuing the inspection? Of course! We have logs to pull from the bridge, a day's time to get from the grav generator, and the required examination to perform on the thrusters, jump drive, and power core. Assuming they're still present... If they're still present, you're telling me some of these incidents involve not having thrust or power in open space and surviving. 
Well, that's what has the Federation so weirded out by these humans. And so, that's why we've got to follow these new MacGyver protocols. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video.